Welcome to Beyond the Lab, a series sponsored by the Office of Career Development within the Biomedical Research Education and Training Department of the School of Medicine. Um, my name is Kate Stewart, and I'm here today with Robert Carnahan. He um, got his PhD in cell and developmental biology and was in Kathy Gould's lab, and then also had a postdoc with Al Reynolds. So we're happy for you to be here. Um, thanks for coming. Thanks. It's good to be here. Um, so tell us your path since Vanderbilt. What have, what have you done since your PhD? Um, well, after completing my PhD in Kathy's lab, I did stay here for a postdoc in Al Reynolds' lab in cancer biology. Um, and I was with Al for three or four years, and um, we went into it with an open mind as I knew I was looking for career options and not necessarily sure what they were. Um, and then the position came up, which uh, I, I work in now, which is directing a core facility here at Vanderbilt. So I actually stayed. I never went anywhere else. <laughs> okay. So tell me what you're doing now. What is What exactly do you do during the day? Okay. Well, I do a couple of different things. Um, essentially, my job is balances between two different things. One is running a core facility, and that's uh, it's called the Antibody and Protein Resource. We make recombinant proteins, antibodies, and do a sort of a whole host of biotechnology-related services and uh, for Vanderbilt faculty. But over the last few years, it's actually spread beyond Vanderbilt as well. We also work with people at other institutions across the country. And that's a, the majority of what I do, but then um, also part of my position is teaching as well. So I teach both uh, medical students, first-year medical students and first-year graduate students with about 30 or 40 percent of my time as well. Okay. So what does a typical day look like? <laughs> uh, a typical day, I guess, involves lots of problem solving. So at any one time in the lab, we're probably running between 30 and 60 projects. Um, I have four, anywhere, it just it varies depending on year to year, but between four and six full-time technicians. So most of my day is spent interfacing with them or interfacing with the PIs on projects we're working with, trying to either set up a project that hasn't started, so sort of problem solving beforehand or really digging into something, which is a lot of times the technicians can carry the projects forward that don't have problems. So I get all the difficult projects. Something's not working. I spend a lot of my time problem solving those issues. Okay, so what does that look like? Meetings, emails, I mean, huh. specifically? A lot of emails. Um, okay. We also have, uh, we went away from big lab meetings. We have what are called Gemba meetings in my lab, which are short meetings, 20-minute meetings that we try to do three or four times a week. Okay. And they're essentially all based on problem solving. The whole group comes together. We'll talk about the project, the problem. Um, we don't cover all projects. We just cover problem projects which are running into issues. And we'll just brainstorm about them. And a lot of times that involves me going out, uh, contacting people or reading more or diving in. So I spend a lot of my time on my own problem solving. A lot of time, if the problem can't be solved in the moment, it's really thinking more deeply about it and try to figure out what is going on. Why can't we make this antibody or this protein or why, why is it not working the way we'd hoped? Okay. So now that you're more advanced in your career, what um, would you wish you would have known as a student or as a postdoc that uh -huh. you know now? Uh -huh. What do I wish I would have known? Um, well, I guess the one thing I didn't get trained for at all, and so other than problem solving, a huge part of my day is managing. And so since I have a group of four or five, anywhere between four and six people, management is a big part. Everything from HR to dealing with people's personal lives and professional lives and motivating the staff and trying to keep people on task and dealing with uh, problems with the people and then anything uh, problems interfacing with what we our customers or pe people we're working with. And so there's no real training for that in graduate school. It's a lot of it is on the spot. No one teaches you how to hire and how to fire and how to motivate and guide a team forward. So I guess more experience or more reading or something <laughs> along those lines where I could have been a little prepared. I say the first couple of years I did this job, I made lots and lots of mistakes in those areas, things I hopefully I would do differently. Okay. So I guess your career search was a little different. What, what do you think were the steps that um, someone who is interested in your field would have to take to get mm -hmm. to where you are, for example? Mm -hmm. um, I guess just this may be more general for someone taking who doesn't want to. So I knew even towards the end of Kathy's lab that I was, I really wanted to stay in science and I love research, but I wasn't necessarily interested in t having an independent position where I was going to run my own lab and write NIH grants. Um, and so then I began to explore options and I specifically chose my postdoc with Al Reynolds so that I could, um, he, he knew that, he was very open to it. And we were even considering one, one option, which would I stay with him long term and help him run his lab, which was pretty, which was really big. You know, he had like 10 people and was finding it hard to manage his lab. But he was also open to me exploring other options. And so one of the things I was fortunate to be able to do is not just 
be interested in other things, we actually go explore them. So I adjunct taught at a small private college and a community college. Um, I did. I was uh, got fortunate enough to do some teaching at Vanderbilt of medical students and some graduate student teaching, and then also exploring that option with Al of like helping him run his lab. Um, I think a lot of times. So when I so I, I think early on, I really was enamored with this idea of going and teaching at a small private college, and thought I would do research with them. This would be really great. And so I went and adjunct taught there and got to know some of the faculty, and it was a good experience. But in in it as well, I found there were things in there that just weren't for me, things that didn't work out, things I didn't really enjoy. Mm -hmm. And so that's something I often tell people who come to me now and talk about stuff is like, well, a lot of things sound really good and they may be very good, it just depends on your personality, but um, really going and visiting with people. I went to MTSU for a, like one or two days and shadowed one of the professors there just to see what their life's like and really dig in and find out, well, what are, because it's easy for us to project you know, what would be good and bad about that based on our own experiences, but it's different to go and get their perspective now that some, with someone who's really been there and spent some time with them. Mm -hmm. um, so how do you network? What are some mm -hmm. of the ways that you keep in touch with your contacts? Mm -hmm. um, so I would, r right out of college, I actually worked for Eli Lilly, so I actually had some experience working in industry as well. And, and at that time, I, the mentor I had then kind of impressed upon me the importance of staying in contact with people who you've trained under or trained with. And I kind of always kept that in mind. And um, so a lot of my networking has actually come out of keeping in constant, or not constant, but just contact with mentors. You know, uh, people who, I did uh, a, a faculty preparation program when I was a graduate student here, and the mentor I had there, um, you know, her and I would meet up for coffee once a year, even when she left Vanderbilt, she went to a, another institution locally. And so we would meet up once or twice a year for coffee. And that led to some of the opportunities later where I got to adjunct teach at some different colleges. And my teaching position where I was first started teaching medical students here um, actually emerged from another uh, mentor person I had in the teaching area here at Vanderbilt. When I wanted to get more into teaching, when I, before I even started to network, I just went back to her and said, what should I do? And, she's, and so she connected me up with Kathy Pettifer here at Vanderbilt and said, go talk to Kathy. She would be the person who would sort of put you in touch with these opportunities. Um, and so I, I think because of that advice I got, I've done a pretty good job of keeping up to, up to like kind of in touch with mentors, even going back to when I worked at Eli Lilly, which was, you know, 20 years ago now, I still have contact with my main mentor there, which mm -hmm. was something he started and fostered and I've been able to keep forward in that. A lot of them, my networking tracks its way back to going back to these resources and going, kind of coming out from there. Yeah. Do you have any, um positive or negative job search experiences that you would want to uh -huh. share to kind of uh -huh. um, have students sympathize with <laughs> the career search and the struggles that it takes to go through it? Um, I mean, the thing that comes to mind is actually more as an interviewer, because I not only have interviewed people for my lab, but I, I'm an interviewer for medical school students as well. So they're kind of, and there's a similarity there. And for me, a lot of, one of the most important things for me as an interviewer comes back to um, consistency, which helps me find trust in what you're saying. So some of the worst interviews I've had are with people who are telling me, um, here's my passion, and they're presenting themselves. This is what I'm interested in. This is what m makes me go. But then when you dive into their track record, there's not really, you know, it, it doesn't really line up. There's no concordance there between what they're saying and what they've been doing. Um, all that to say is generally I feel confident in my lab that if we bring someone in, if they have a basic set of skills, we can teach them what they need to know. But what I need to know is that, that they really want to be there, they're motivated to be there, so that would be sort of part of that, that you're interested, and that I can trust them and that, you know, that we're, we're, we're already starting off on a good foot. So I think what I often have told people when they're talking about interviews is be thinking now, what is your passion? What are you interested in? And then do those things now. Start to think about how your story looks on paper because you want the paper story to line up with the interview story. And so sure. those things should go together. Yeah. Um, let's shift a little bit and talk about your work-life balance. What does mm -hmm. that look like? What does that mean to you? Uh -huh. So that, I mean, I don't know if everyone says this, it's really important to me. So I have two kids, um, two children, uh, a, a very little girl. We have an infant and an eight-year-old. Um, and so it's a non-negotiable in my life. Um, and it's one of the reasons why I was thinking of alternative careers in the first place. Um, 
how, how do I balance that? Uh, <laughs> I try to stick to a pretty strict schedule, you know, so it's, it's making sure that I have time um, at work to get everything done here and, and then also making sure that I know that I, at certain point I have to go home and not carry it all with me. I mean, it's not that I don't work some evenings when kids are in bed and stuff like that. That happens, but um, I also don't want to shortchange them out by just only focusing on work. So I, I don't know. I think it's having boundaries, a good boundaries. <laughs> okay, good. Um, what are some words of wisdom that you would want to give students and postdocs who are in the career search mm -hmm. you know, now? And what, what kind of last minute or words of wisdom would you mm -hmm. want to extend? Mm -hmm. I guess I go back to the, the visiting people. Um, I think when you're looking for a career, it takes some, some real brutal honesty. A lot of times I find when people are in a position they don't like, it's easy to be enamored with a position that they're not in. Uh, and only really, I think, going and visiting those places and not and trying to be objective and really put yourself in the position of those people, do you get a, a real feel for um, not just bailing out of what you don't like, but I, the worst possible case sometimes is people jump out of one thing they don't like and kind of rush into the next thing, and they don't like that either. And then, then you start to build also this resume and track record of, of, of hopping around to things, and that doesn't look good either. So um, I think what I would say is, is be patient um, and go make, build relationships with people in the area that you think might be interesting and try to build deep ones where you really are talking with them, visiting, maybe even working with them to whatever extent you can, which I know is a little tricky at some points, but um, uh, really putting a lot of thought into those destinations and not allowing yourself, really, which is really easy to, to idealize or those positions, because those people have a, very diff have a very different set of circumstances, both bad and good as well. Great. Well, thank you very much for coming, Robert. We enjoyed having you. Thanks. Thanks. It's nice to be here. <laughs>